you. So a few years ago, I got an email in my inbox that said, summer research opportunity, iPad software to help deaf cochlear implant users. Now, I think normally people would read past the title before they decided to join a project, but I'm not all that normal. I had just fallen out of love with everything wet lab in my sophomore year. I could not stand to be at a bench pipetting the minusculest amounts of liquid into different petri dishes anymore. And I had just learned about cochlear implants, so I decided I could give it a shot. I had also had a grandfather who had just recently passed, an organic chemistry professor at Penn State University who had gone deaf himself because of all the explosions in his lab. He had inspired me to go into engineering, so I considered this as kind of a tribute to his life and his career. So I scanned through the email, quickly responded to it, and a few days later, I walked into the office of Dr. Tilak Ratnanathar, who I would soon find out had made a large part of his career propelling deaf students toward their academic goals. He was deaf himself. He wears a cochlear implant, and he's charismatic, and talkative, not anything like I had imagined someone who was deaf to be like. He taught me to be compassionate, but not to pity, to meet people where they are right now, but to see their potential for overcoming the seemingly insurmountable obstacles that they face in their future, and to empower them to get there. And all of this should underlie our systematic approach to improving the human condition. So we started as a team of three students, and today I'm here representing Speech Banana. Oh. And today I'm here representing Speech Banana. <laughs> an auditory training app that now nine of us have worked on, and I'd like to share a little bit about what I've learned through my time on this project. Starting with this question, how many people here know someone who's deaf or hard of hearing? Raise your hand. Huh, not as many people as I thought. So throughout the world, 360 million people or over the entire population of the United States is deaf or hard of hearing. And of those, 36 million of them use a device to help regain that sense. Now, you might be thinking, once they get the device, isn't that enough? It turns out not. And that's due to a number of different factors that have to do with what kind of device you're getting and when you get that in your life. For instance, if I'm deaf, and my deafness has to do with my outer or my middle ear, like my eardrum or some teeny tiny bones that vibrate to give me sound to my ear, I'm more likely to get a hearing aid. If, however, my deafness comes from my inner ear, where some cells are no longer uh, where my cells are no longer delivering the electronic pulses that they should be, I'm much more likely to get a cochlear implant. And while neither of them deliver perfect sound, the cochlear implant is much more difficult to understand because we're trained to hear a full range of sound, everything from a mosquito to a bass in an orchestra and beyond. And a cochlear implant can't deliver that range of sound. So it becomes very difficult to understand. There are some... Um, there are some simulations that you can find online, and I have so much trouble understanding even the simplest sentence. Now, if I get any of these devices, my age also affects my ability to work with these devices. For instance, if I get a cochlear implant prelingually, that is under the age of three before I've learned language, 
my brain is really plastic. It moves very quickly according to the environment. So if I change the environment, I can learn pretty quickly to learn how to use that. I've worked with six-year-olds who speak flawlessly, and the only stumbling that they do is over their shoelaces. Otherwise, they have perfect comprehension. If you're implanted postlingually, though, maybe in your adulthood or late adulthood, it's kind of a different story. Your brain is a lot less plastic, and it takes a longer period of time to learn how to use the device best and to understand completely. So generally, people who receive cochlear implants when they're older are the people who struggle most. Aside from the devices themselves and the brain response that we have, there are a number of other issues that come into play with learning to use the devices properly. One is schooling. So if you're young, you're likely in school, and you're probably getting the training that you need. There are a lot of programs for young children to learn to use their devices, and they're speaking with tons of other kids, so they have a lot of input. If I'm older, though, I probably won't get that exposure. It's a lot more difficult. There are in-person sessions, which allows me to go to a clinic and get some sort of formal training, but that turns out to be really expensive. And insurance doesn't pay for it because it sees it as an educational thing rather than a physical therapy need. So I will have to pay for it out of my own pocket. If I do manage that, time becomes an issue, especially if I'm balancing a full-time job. So there are some people who have come up with new platforms to do this same type of learning on a computer at home or on a mobile tablet. But we've found that they tend to be kind of boring and not very intuitive. So you can see that there are a lot of variables that go into how well you'll be able to hear after you get one of these devices. So with all that in mind, we came up with a goal, which was to create an inexpensive, portable, and effective app that was geared toward adults that could provide as good or maybe even better training than you would get in person. So we have a motive now. How are we going to do that best? So we first decided to go with Apple because that's really popular in the US, but we decided later that we wanted to reach a much larger audience around the world. So right now we're working on a web-based application so anyone with internet could access it. We decided to take a system that we knew worked um, based on some consulting that we did so that right from the get-go, we knew we were most likely to deliver an effective service. We also wanted to challenge them with specificity and variety of sound, so we track their progress based on phonemes. Phonemes are the basic sounds of each word, so perhaps ah or t or ts, for instance. And we provide them with background noises, like as if they're in a cafe or, with, um, or in traffic when we also provide um, male and female voices. And this provides a rich sound experience that most closely mimics what they'll experience in everyday life. So I've showed you a little bit about how this app works, but how would I walk through this app if I were actually using it? I want to take you on a little tour. This is Speech Banana. At the bottom, you can see, oh, at the bottom, you can see instructions for how to use it, um, an about section for how to contact us, your progress if you've been using it for a while, and at the top, you have chapters. If I were to click on the chapters, I would see a series of seven chapters divided up into a bunch of lessons, and they go in order of difficulty from easiest to hardest. And if I were to click on a lesson, I would come to a page like this, which all of them look like flashcards. In this lesson, if I were to click on the play button at the top, I would hear lane and lawn said together because they sound pretty similar, and I want to be sure that I understand the differences between these two words. So I can play these as long as I want, as many times as I need, until I feel confident that I know how all these words sound. Afterwards, I can go to a quiz page where we put the words into a sentence, and I type what I hear, and then I hear, I see how well I do. So we have kind of a basic app right now, but 
what can we do to grow further and make this even better for the people that are using it? Well, one is additional languages. We are finishing up a Korean version, and I've been developing a Polish version while I'm here in Poland, um, so that people who use it might be able to learn language with the system, which is really exciting. We also want to provide visual feedback. This could help them in learning the mouth movements so that they could be understood as well as understand, which is more than half the battle in learning how to use this. We also want to have adaptive training so that I feel challenged the whole time, but not so frustrated that I give up, like on other si systems that I might have used. And we also want to do something called gamification, which is my favorite part. There's some research, some early research, but some research that shows that the more a task looks like a video game, the more likely I am to stick with it and learn the material better and longer. So that seems like a really fantastic avenue for us to continue on. Now, this is great. We've covered we're starting to cover the um, auditory population, but is this something that we could use for greater populations all around the world? I think we can. For instance, if someone has um, a muscular disability, for instance, we could use this gamification to develop something that looks like Dance Dance Revolution or a Wii-based physical app that gets them moving in ways that make sense in normal life. So when they walk away from the game, they can literally walk or sit down carefully or pick something up that's really delicate. We can also use gamification for aging, for aging brains, or for neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's or Huntington's. Maybe they have a scavenger navigation hunt that they go through, and that keeps their brain um, moving and feeling young. I say moving because this is what I think we can do. Right now, the way that people see aging brains is that they stop being able to adapt to their environments. But if you think about it, the brain still is moving. It's just moving in a way that's not beneficial to the person that actually owns that brain. So if we accept that the brain is still making changes, the question then becomes, can we train it, can we train our brain again to make changes that are positive for the better? And I think we can and it has to do with this gamification. So I see a future where instead of being at risk for alienation from our family or our friends, we can go hiking on the beach or take college classes at 60, 70, 80 years old. And to me, that's really exciting. The notion that we'll be able to live more fully and with greater experiences as we get older and older with time. Thank you. <laughs>